Reverend Dr. Suzanne Castle is an internationally acclaimed speaker, author, and artist. From the stage in Cats to You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, to The Nutcracker, and the screen in Ghost Squadron and Rules of Engagement, Dr. Castle has always had a love for the merging of rituals and art. Her seminary training was with Claremont School of Theology, and her doctorate is in worship studies with a specialty in pop culture rituals. Her books include the award-winning Chalice Press publication, Brim, Creative Overflow and Worship Design with musician Andrew Moran. And recently, you can read her essay in The Theology of Prince, published by Lexington Press. Suzanne loves bringing the extraordinary sparkle back into people's lives and helping them capture a capture vision full of joy and verb. She's currently pastor and leadership strategist residing in Fort Worth. And among all of her uh, consulting activities, um, she consults with churches and musicians and other groups on uh, the topic we're here to learn about tonight, copyright. So Suzanne, thanks for being with us. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. That was a very generous uh, and wonderful introduction. Thank you for having and sponsoring this. I cannot wait to dive right in with you. There is so much information. I wanna start off though by setting the tone a little bit. I want you to get back in your dream space with me. Imagine for just a moment that it is Sunday whenever your church has their services. Could be Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. Maybe you do a Wednesday Vespers. You've got people inside your church. Remember those days? They're socially distanced. You also have a cadre of worshipers online ready for worship to begin on your Facebook page and on your YouTube channel. And as the service kicks off, a wonderful video starts welcoming folks using a song that was recently recorded and released by a popular Christian artist. And the words of the song on the bottom of the screen were done by your team on a lower third so anyone can sing along. And as usual, the service is recorded in its entirety for the convenience of those not in attendance for in-person or live streaming. And it's uploaded to your website and links are distributed in your weekly email. This scenario is all too common right now and depicts a lot of our situations in church, in many churches across the country, not just in the Oklahoma region. However, what I would say to you is there are a lot of inadvertent violations of law that are taking place in the example I just gave you. In fact, many violations, including the, distri the distribution of the recorded event, unless you have the right license, the publishing of lyrics to copyrighted music on a screen are two different violations. And the recording of copyrighted music, just to name a few. You're lucky if your feed didn't get turned off on Facebook. How many of us have had that happen in the middle of service? Or maybe your YouTube channel stopped working, but you didn't know why. Or the sound just stopped on Facebook or YouTube. You see the video, but there's no sound because it just marked your video, your worship, as violating the rules of content. You don't know how to get out of Facebook jail. Your people are frustrated. You're frustrated. And then you get a letter from the U.S. Copyright Office and you're afraid to open it. I totally get it. Most churches would say that they are or trying to be copyright compliant. But the problem is, like in this illustration, many of us are really unaware that the church is not meeting all the requirements and that they have failed to ask permission in the right manner with the right documentation. But tonight, I really hope to further your understanding of the ethical nature of following copyright law and to give you some resources for creating meaningful worship events that are engaging and that keep you compliant. So here's what we're gonna cover, just so that you know the lay of the land. We're gonna talk about the myths of copyright that churches tell themselves. We're gonna cover what copyright law indicates for religious use and how to stay compliant for in-person streaming and recording. And at the end, we're gonna have some Q&A. So I'm gonna do my best to field questions, and if I'm not really sure about what you're asking, I promise I will give you an answer because at the end, I am creating a live document that has all this information in it as well as links to resources, and I will answer any question at that point as well. So you'll have the live copy and a printed copy to help you along. But first, I would be reticent if I didn't tell you I'm not an attorney. 
nor do I specialize in copyright law. All of what I am sharing with you is hard-won knowledge from research, from consulting with congregations who get in trouble, and, for t and from talking to copyright folks. And I will tell you right now, this might be the most important thing I say. If you feel you are unsure, if you have gotten pinged, dinged, or flagged in any way whatsoever, you need to refer the issue to an attorney that specializes in this field and don't wait, okay? Now, here's how to keep track of your questions. My recommendation, you can go ahead and pop them in the chat along the way. I've closed my chat so I'm not gonna see them or you can jot them down on the notes if, you, if you're taking notes and then I'm gonna ask you to pre-populate them at the end. Does that sound good to everybody? Thumbs up if your video's on. Okay, excellent. We're gonna race through, but first, I want to give you some real life horror stories. A composer and a publisher of religious music not too long ago was awarded more than 3.1 million with an M dollars by a federal district court jury that found that the Archdiocese of Chicago was guilty of illegally photocopying his works. Linda Ellis, who is an author of the poem, The Dash, maybe you've heard it because it's used a lot in funerals and memorial services, is a copyrighted poem. She has a whole business built around her art and she has explicitly denied any right to publish her work. Here's what happens, it gets shared in funerals, memorial services, they go live on YouTube. And while it's quite all right to quote the poem as part of a religious service, you can't publish it on a website or have a recording of it. She is entitled to enforce her copyright and aggressively she does this. She makes claims constantly against churches and the claim amount is starts at $5,000. Another church just started selling recordings of a song that the member of that church had written for that church and sung in that church. Here's what happened. The church failed to obtain permission to use the song and then put it out on their YouTube channel and the member sued and won a judgment for $1 million. This is the biggest one that I think probably a lot of us have heard about, and there's a second lawsuit. Music composer Yes Music, they filed a complaint against First Baptist Church of Smyrna, Tennessee. It was all over the news. They sought a judgment exceeding $150,000 because the church performed two of the musical compositions in a worship service, which they had permission to do but then they live streamed it, which they did not have permission to do. They won, and now they're in the middle of a multi-million dollar case with Joel Osteen. Here's the thing. We like to tell ourselves a lot of myths as church. We want to just say, gosh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, I didn't know. And much of the copyright infringement that occurs is because many of us have believed some myths that we tell ourselves, maybe we overheard from another pastor, we were walking in a hallway, we heard someone, we see a church do something so we think it's okay. And I'm really not sure how all of these myths came to be, but I can tell you one thing after today, I want you to go and sin no more. So the first myth that I'm gonna share with you is that we're a church and therefore we're exempt from copyright and performance licensing. That is a really big giant trap that we, that we really fall into routinely because we think we get a tax break. We're a nonprofit, so certainly the copyright law doesn't ever apply to us because we, we are the gospel bringers of hope, gosh darn. So we don't have to pay anything, right? Nope, not even close. You don't ever get a copyright break. I'm gonna say that again, you don't ever get a copyright break. It doesn't mean that you can use other people's copyrighted work in any way you see fit. And there are some things you can do and there are some breaks, I'm gonna talk about that, but you need to put it in your mind, I don't get a break, and then figure out what that means. There is a whole lot you can't do. And you must stay up to date because it is always changing to be compliant. During the pandemic, what we've seen is some companies have allowed their works to be used for a short period of time, but people are still doing it like it was in March or April. And what happened is a lot of these companies beginning June 1st asked you to go back into compliance and we haven't been doing that. Asking forgiveness is not a good option. The second myth is that our CCLI license, if you have one of those, keeps us protected regarding performance licensing. What I say to people when they say that is, you wish. There is a generic CCLI that covers the printing of songs, 
the printing of hymns, some of them, and lyrics for congregational singing. It covers those, you know, creative Christmas song books that your church hands out during the Christmas service or when you used to go caroling in the nursing home for congregational singing only. That same license covers your lyric projection for congregational singing. Do you see a trend here? But wait, there's more. The CCLI license covers your band's creative music arrangement and their recording of worship service onto like a CD or a DVD, but only in a limited manner, which is where people get confused because there are other licenses you need and other companies. So stay tuned. I'm going to tell you more about that in just a minute. Here's the third myth that I see churches like to share with each other. That is that we can broadcast our church service under the religious service copyright exception. Well, yes, there is a copyright exemption, but it's not a get out of Facebook jail or YouTube jail free card. You can broadcast your service, you can, without paying licensing and royalties. That's good news. As long as you aren't broadcasting music that would otherwise require licensing. That's where we get in trouble. You see, it's not just a full low license. So let me put it this way. If you wanted to, the band, let's say you have a band at your church, and you want to play Where the Streets Have No Name by U2, you can't do it if you're going to air it outside the building, and that means streaming, or then loading it anywhere else. And the same goes for most any copyrighted music, most copyrighted music. So I want you to stay tuned. I'm going to help you figure out what you can do and then what you do need so you can stay compliant. But I thought it might be helpful if we took just a brief glimpse on the copyright law, okay? Because I think this, most people have no idea. So what is it? Well, most, most people know that the copyright law literally means right to copy. But that term really has a bigger umbrella now that we, with digital performance rights and management and streaming. So you have to think of it as a body of exclusive rights that's been granted by a statute given to authors and creatives for the protection of their writing and art. And because so many of our church services right now are continuing to explore so many wonderful ways of creatively expressing the God within us and the God without us, we're making it more accessible than ever online. That's amazing. But that also means that we are more at risk of infringement than we've ever, ever been. So here's what kind of creative works can be copyrighted. And this you can find, and I'm going to put it in the resource document, in section 102 of the Copyright Act. So it's called works of authorship. Here is the list, and this is where churches get in trouble. Anything that is music related, that could be accompanying words, could be lyrics, could be notes about the composition. It must appear in some published format. That means it's copyrighted. Sound recordings. This is any kind of reproduction of some material, and it may or may not be copyrighted. This is where it gets scary. So there are works that result from, you know, a series of musical, spoken word is part of sound recordings. Other sounds, like if um, you downloaded uh, the sound of um, a shofar, for example, but you didn't pay for that recording, you're in trouble. So there are all these sounds that accompany motion pictures. That also can get you into trouble or any other audiovisual work. Literary works. These are things like words captured as a book, like we know that one, but also periodicals, poems, essays, anything that you pull off the internet, like an email that you're sharing, a speech, any kind of spoken work. And these also include what's now called neo-non-dramatic textual works, which means a graphic novel, for example, so sometimes it's an illustration, a comic book, for example, that's considered under literary works. There's also visual arts. So these are things like pictures, graphics, photos, sculptures, anything that's two or three dimensional works. They could be fine art, could be graphic art, any kind of applied art. Also covered is choreography, dance, pantomime. So any kind of composition or arrangement of dance movements and moving the body. If you have your own version of the Lord's Prayer that you do a body prayer with, you need to copyright that and make sure you're not using someone else's copyrighted version of that or at least give them credit. So usually though, this falls under 
anything that is intended to be accompanied by music. So sometimes you can get out of jail there if you say, well, this wasn't intended for music. But it might fall under the stipulation for drama. So these are things, you know, like plays, any kind of dialogue, readers, theater. If there's a stage direction, the drama copyright sometimes also includes musical scores. So you have to be super, super careful here. Audio visual covers all of video and films. Any kind of related visual images that give an impression of motion. So that may or may not be accompanied by sound. So you could even have a slide presentation. You could have a video game that maybe your youth group is using to talk about. This is covered under copyright law. And architecture, we forget this one a lot. So this is an original design of a building that's embodied in any tangible medium of expression. So buildings, plans, or drawings. It's a lot. It is an absolute lot. And preachers get us all in trouble as they try to put these wonderful images up when they're preaching. So this is the stop. Remember I said, go and sin no more. So here's what happens. There are exclusive rights that are given to copyright owners. Here's what that means. If you want to engage in any of the activities I just mentioned, any of them, that are the exclusive right of a works owner. For example, uh, Jeff in the introduction talked about Brim with Andra and I. We have all sorts of information in there and we tell you the way to use it. That's considered an exclusive right, which gives you permission, but it also tells you how you have to use it. And if it doesn't have that, then you must get permission from the owner to engage in that activity. So this could include reproduction. So reproducing a copy of work like photocopying lyrics making a rehearsal track, you know, um, you, you're going to copy the VBS music and send it home with all your kiddos so they can get ready for when they're doing the performance. That's considered reproduction. Any digital copy you're making of a video. If you're using pirated um, software to allow you to pull down a YouTube video, you are not in compliance. Another thing that, it, that you need to think about is any making der derivative work. So these are creating new works that are based on a pre-existing work. So for example, you're going to do your own arrangement of a song for your congregation. You're going to do your own adaptation of a play into a movie. You're going to change the lyrics because you don't like what somebody wrote in 1812 and it doesn't apply to 2020. You have to be really, really careful. Anytime you're going to be doing any form of a distribution, making a work available to the public by sale or rental or lease, Lending. If you lend information like you're going to share curriculum, let's say the region puts out a curriculum and they say you can share this church to church, you have to be sure that all the rights and the copyright are kosher like this or you can get into trouble, especially if you distribute it online, which includes an email. How about performance? So anytime that your church is doing a performance like you're playing, you're performing publicly, drive-in church, that is considered a performance, not worship. That extends to more than just what we would consider like a coffee house performance. So it could be playing music. Um, if you have TVs in uh, your sanctuary when we come back to church and you have music underneath your announcements and you, haven't, you don't have the right license to be playing that music, you are not in compliance. If you are streaming a service over the radio, you have to have a certain license to do that. Just because you got a free radio bandwidth does not mean that you're in compliance. There are several different levels there. Anything over the internet, concerts, music's played at any church social events, right? If uh, your church phone system has on hold music, I hope you're paying the rights management on that. Also, when you are displaying publicly any work of art. This is similar to performance, but really I'm thinking more like for photographs. So anytime you're putting thing on um, any kind of, you know, display projector or anything like that, if you're displaying a work of art, you have to have a permission. And I always say, even if it's a church member, I, that's why I started off with one of those horror stories, make sure they've given you permission to do that. And then finally, digital recording. So I want you to think about it this way. When a sound recording work is transmitted digitally, there's, there's a relatively new right that was added. So in 1995, there, there was passed the Digital Performance Right and Sound Recordings Act. It's a big name. But what it really means is any streaming on the internet or any capability you might have to produce a digital sound recording that is featured in a worship service, internet radio, or public radio. This is where it gets scary. 
This is why it's really important to understand copyright law and to give it just as much attention as you do the exegesis for your scripture on Sunday. So the United States Constitution actually gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times authors and inventors. And what they've done is they've given them exclusive right. Here's what that means. In essence, the author or artist of a copyrighted work has the exclusive right to control the reproduction, adaptation, publication, performance, display of the work that they have produced, and they can also determine how that work is used and in what capacity it can be used in. This is where churches get in trouble. So anytime any action violates one of those exclusive rights I just mentioned on all of those different ways in which copyright can be held is considered unlawful, here is the scary, scary phrase, whether it was a deliberate violation or not. So that's why I said, don't say, oh gosh, I didn't know. Now, here is one benefit. It's very limited but it is known as the religious services exemption. I mentioned it a little while ago. While this religious services exemption is super helpful for churches, here's what it means, and there are conditions. What it means is, it's, it's in 110.3, I believe, in the Copyright Act of 1976. It means that you can't have a performance of a non-dramatic literary or musical work of a religious nature. You can also display work in the course of a service at a place of worship. Now, everybody's like, great. Well, this was a church thing, and I did it at a bar. Or we, we went and had a small group meeting at so-and-so's house. That does not consider a place of worship. So in essence, a church doesn't necessarily have to get permission from the copyright owner to perform or display lyrics of a copyrighted piece of work that's religious in nature during a live worship event in an actual building that has been designated by your congregation to be a place of worship. Does that make sense? If that's making sense, I know I'm throwing so much out at you at one time, but that's why it's important to know that it doesn't include reproduction or copying of lyrics to worship songs because that would not be a performance. Okay. It also, um, it does allow for some exemption when you're performing copyrighted music only again in a designated place of worship. So for example, churches that are doing drive-in worship, if they haven't reestablished their address as a parking lot, they can get in trouble. They can get in big trouble. So now here's some good news. However, however, the recording, the broadcast, the streaming, the other transmission and performance at a worship service, it's not exempt under the religious service exemption. And I would say most churches aren't getting in trouble at this point. What I heard from copyright attorneys is as of January 1, that was changing, which is why this workshop is so timely for people. The grace period is over. Now, I want you to note that the exemption I just talked about does not include any secular music, none whatsoever, only music of a religious nature. So this special provision that churches really receive under the copyright law, it's amazing, but it really only covers two basic types of the eight that I mentioned. So that's non-dramatic literary and music that is religious in nature. And it only covers two of the exclusive rights, which means public performance and public display in your actual designated worship space. So you can see it gets a little messy and all of us, I think at one time or another, have probably violated copyright law without understanding what it is. So you can see things like uh, visual images, uh, choreography, architecture, reproduction, that's not included in this exemption. So you have to be super, super careful. So like I said, there are really three areas that when I'm brought in, I see copyright commonalities among churches. And these are really in printed material, in music, and in multimedia. So uh, real quick, most of us understand what we can't do with printed materials, but I want to be sure we're all on the same page. So in printed materials, that really means, you know, oftentimes I know we're all watching our budgets. I'm, I'm serving a teeny tiny church. We have no money. So a church might use various resources or authored works for church activities, maybe a board meeting. 
The issue in many of these circumstances occurs when there's unauthorized copies of the resources that are made and distributed. And I know you're saying, oh, my good church people, they're never going to turn me in. They might not. They might not. But somebody might see something or they might accidentally say something in a thing or they might turn around and share something that you shared with a friend who shares it with a friend who shares it with a friend. It's too easy now to do that. So in such situations, it's really best to purchase copies of the resources for everyone or what I did when I used a resource and we just didn't have enough money, I just called the author and asked them to write an email and was it okay for me to just, I really honestly needed four pages of a book and the person was like, of course, no problem. So easy peasy, it took five minutes of my time. The other area is music. So churches really most often commit copyright infringement when they print or copy lyrics. And that could be in a bulletin, most of us aren't using those right now, but slides in a worship service, in a presentation, even if um, our minister is pro you know, producing things from their house like me and they have a TV screen behind them and they've put lyrics up for you to sing along to, maybe when they're doing sheet music for an entire team. Copyright infringement also occurs though when churches record or broadcast or transmit the performance of a copyrighted song. You can only do that if you have a certain license, a certain license. And then finally, in the area of multimedia, which I think is probably where most of you are a little bit scared right now, and that, that includes hosting a movie night at your church, uh, using video clips of movies and TV shows. Uh, multimedia, it's a really vital part of our worship services today. It's, I got my doctorate in pop culture, but without a video license that gives permission to use these tools, copyright infringement is still taking place. So I have been Debbie Downer. I get that but I want you to stay compliant. So real quick, let me just tell you what some of the penalties might be. I'm trying to scare you into goodness. So for example, the copyright holder, they can calculate the actual amount of financial loss that results from your infringement, sue you for that amount, and then they can add other punitive damages to the suit. That's what happened to that church member who recorded a song for that church. They didn't have permission, they distributed it. They got a small amount for the copyright infringement, but it was punitive damages on top of that. Rather than calculating and providing actual damages, the copyright owner might opt for what is called statutory damages. So these have been set by the government and they range from $750, that's the lowest one, to $30,000 per infringement, which could mean every single slide of a song could be $750, $750, $750. $750. It's not per song. Statutory damages also can go up to $150,000 per infringement if it's considered willful. So, and here's what I've noticed is a lot of copyright owners have discovered over time that it's often to their advantage to claim willful infringement for every claim and then settle for a lesser amount. That's that scary letter I talk about that you open it and it calls willful infringement of a copyright violation. It says you will be sued up to $150,000 and that scares churches. I have, I have been in a meeting where that was open in front of me when I was consulting with someone. It's very frightening. So before we jump into the licenses that you're going to need to stay compliant, let me tell you how you can be truthful instead of living in myth land. We're going to live in truth land and cover some worshipful situations and I hope you're getting your questions ready to go. This is where your questions are coming from, I'm sure. So the first one is that churches do not need a performance license to play or perform copyrighted music in a worship service. Note the importance of those last words. Your church can play music if you have a coffee shop. You could play it as part of the telephones on hold music. I said that earlier. Uh, you could do it during vacation Bible school, in Sunday school, whatever it is. But in such cases, you really need to follow copyright protocol and pay for the licensing to do that. It is only in the case of the worship service that you're free to use the music by playing it or performing it. And this isn't covered for any reproduced, pre-produced, or streaming service. It's for in-person, live only, not recorded, and not distributed in any fashion. Okay? Now, let's look at the second truth. Even though technology has brought us to this point where we can think of church services as always an online option, right? I think we realize we're not going to go back to what we thought of as normal. We're probably all going to have some kind of way that people can participate from a computer or from their house or their personal device, or maybe some churches love the drive-in option and they're always going to be on the radio at a certain time and a certain day. 
You must think of a church service as an event which occurs at a certain location that has already been decided upon where a congregation is physically present. So any other broadcast or rebroadcast requires special performance licensing. So what does this include? Things like podcasts, radio, internet streaming, Facebook Live, YouTube, IGTV, any other form. If you're a TikTok church, any other form of broadcast or rebroadcast. And yes, that does include drive-in church options in the park options because that is not in your designated worship space. And if you are streaming it live or you're making it available to watch in any form after the live event, you have to have a certain license to do so. Here's another truth. Think with me of all of the ways, all of the ways, all of the various licenses and protective measures that can cover certain ways which you can use the music, video, etc. instead of how you can perform or broadcast the music. Here's the thing. A license is just one step in following proper copyright usage. So all of that being said, now that I've scared you to death and you're so tired, I've been talking for almost 35 minutes about all the mess, where are we gonna begin? Well, here is what I would tell you to do first. Assess and assess carefully. There are a variety of licensing packages available and you want to get exactly what you need. By using an organization to help you stay compliant, you won't have to approach each individual artist or record label, but maybe just every so often. You will, however, for some songs and some movies, etc. It gets super confusing, super fast. But I'm going to see if I can clear it up a bit. And remember when I said at the, when at the end of this, I'm going to have a handout. It'll come out in the email, so not tonight, but in the email. And I'm going to have a little graph for you that shows you all the different options so you know how to choose. So... Here's, um, here's some questions you should ask yourself in your assessment. Do you broadcast? Do you podcast? Do you stream? Do you rebroadcast? Do you record? Do you include all of the worship or some of the worship? Does your pastor ever use music in a sermon illustration or a video or a commercial? I want you to think about all the situations very, very carefully. Do you project lyrics? Do you put them in your bulletins? Do you make copies of lyrics? Does a Sunday school class show a YouTube video with a TED Talk? You want to get all of your ministries involved to help you cover all of the options, and I would say cover all the possible options. If you even think that you're going to be using TED Talks for your youth group, I'm in a public forum Facebook group right now where they're advocating for TED Talks to be used for youth groups. Great idea. And here I am, the copyright police, going, hey, hey, wait a minute. Let's make sure that we're, we're staying in compliance here. Just think in advance. So I want to cover super briefly the major options you can get and why you need what. And I realize this is a lot of information. So again, I'm going to give you some handouts. And I just want you to remember the key points in the presentation. Okay? It's a lot to take in. Using the right license for the right thing is crucial. And there are several types of packages that you can purchase so you can create what you actually need uh, and you can do it as a one time or even in short term or even on an annual basis. And some are more comprehensive there than others. But there are really four choices that I'm going to, there, there are a few others, but there are really four that you need to concern yourself with. So the major holders for most churches include four companies and I'm going to talk about them. So one license, Christian Copyright Solutions, Christian Copyright Licensing International, and Christian Video Licensing International. And they all cover different aspects. So again, assess and consider your specific needs and do your homework. And of course, let me know if you need me. So the first one, let's talk about one license. Here's what you need to know. Through one license, license holders have access to literally thousands of congregational hymns. For a lot of us in Disciple Them, really one license is a really important resource for us, okay? Songs, it does a lot of liturgical service music, a lot of our choral pieces, a lot of cantatas, really anything that's coming out from the top liturgical music publishers to use in worship aids, it allows for reprinting in service bulletins. They, they have a whole projection and lyric way that you can do that to inspire congregational singing. One license supports all kinds of congregational singing, uh, reprinting, projecting, podcasting, streaming music, as well as copying practice tracks for rehearsal. It's really wonderful. And most of their work uh, really supports liturgical publishing houses that we use, like Hope 
and Abingdon, etc. And currently there's about 300 publishing houses. They're adding some every month. And there's about, at last count that I saw, about 80,000 different titles. It's a really good place to start for our churches if you don't know about one license. Then there's the biggie that a lot of us have heard about, which is CCLI. So Christian Copyright Licensing International, I call it CCLI, it's also music-centered like one license. And it does cover things like the printing of lyrics, copying songs for congregational uses like bulletins and programs and song sheets, displaying the lyrics on a screen. But it also covers arranging and new arrangements used for congregation when there's no other avenue that's available to you. It does allow for the recording of worship services, but not accompaniment tracks. But it does, and it does not, though, allow for copying instrumental works. That's where one license really comes into bear. And it also features a lot of praise music or modern music. If what would you think of as contemporary Christian music, you're going to find that on CCLI and not on One License. So again, One License is really kind of hymn based, and CCLI is really of the other kind of music based. So most churches right now, unless you're super traditional, you really need both. Now, here's what you need to know about CCLI. They have several different things, and people get them confused. So that's the music part is just CCLI. Then there is the streaming part of the CCLI empire, and it's really streaming and podcasting. And it's a different license that allows for you to legally stream and legally podcast your live recorded worship service music, etc., on your church's website or any other streaming service. That includes Facebook, that includes YouTube, that includes IGTV, etc. And all of the CCLI songs are covered under the streaming and podcast license, but you also have to buy the copyright license as well. So that's where they get you. You have to double dip there. But it doesn't cover streaming of secular songs, okay? Just Christian, which is why that C in, the CC, Christian copyright, is really important to remember. You have to have a separate license. I'm gonna to talk to you about that from the Performance Rights Society. So then some of you in some churches, you really need to also be adding what's called the church rehearsal part of CCLI which really would allow your music directors, worship leaders to copy, share commercial audio recordings via email or flash drives. Um, if you use Planning Center and you share files on Planning Center that are music related, you have to have the church rehearsal license. Song copies are not intended for long-term personal use, but it's really, really important here that you think about those options. Then under the same umbrella but different is what's called the church video license, which is run by CCLI, but now is a completely different company. <coughs> Excuse me. CVLI is all about the videos. So what it does is it provides legal coverage for churches, for ministry organizations, including your kids ministry, youth ministry, outreach, uh, small groups to show motion pictures, any audio visual programs, um, and each organization, though, has to be specifically covered. This is where they get you. So you can't necessarily always have just a CDL license for your whole organization. Depending on how you use video clips, mm -hmm. you might need one for your worship, you might need one for kids, you might need one for your daycare. Um, and, and the neat thing about their coverage is you can just use a few minutes of a movie and all the way up to showing a full-length feature film. So this is really great if you're doing um, you know, a lock-in for your youth, et cetera, et cetera. And, and wing clips, which um, I'll put that in the resources. I didn't put a slide up for wing clips, but it's actually a movie database that all the permissions are already paid. It's already done in short clips for sermons and you don't have to have a special license to use it. You buy credits and each clip is so many credits. So you can use them for Sunday school, et cetera. You just pay a fee per clip. Okay, then, again, this is why it's so so darn scary, is that there's a group called the Christian Copyright Solutions. Here is what they do. So they really think about streaming. So when you think about Worship Cast, that's a streaming license that covers 16 million songs. And that's from the catalogs of the three major biggies in music production, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. So this is for when your CCLI license doesn't cover the song that you use. They have a database you put the song in. One license, same thing. They have a database you put the song in. You don't see them on either one. You can't use it unless you have a worship cast license. See, CCLI, it's limited to about 250,000 songs. One license is 80,000, and that's a lot. 
but it doesn't cover the secular side. And a lot of us are in error on this one. And, and the thing about worship cast is webcasts can be live or they can be on demand, which means they're not limited to worship service. So if you're using stuff in youth and you want to show it later, the license will also cover concerts, any studio recordings of, uh, that your music team might be doing, but it doesn't cover the downloading of music. That's a whole different thing that we're probably not going to get into tonight. Then there is what's called perform music. I can see why everybody's confused. Same company, different license. Remember how I mentioned uh, Vacation Bible School and you're sending out all the things for the kids to learn or you're on hold music for your, for, your, um, for your church telephones? Well, Perform Music is the place for that. So this covers that same 16 plus million songs from those three biggies, but it covers anything outside of church worship. So it's things uh, that are live, pre-recorded, like uh, non-ticketed concerts, if you're using music at a retreat, so any retreat center in the region, you really need to perform music license. <laughs> Um, small groups, uh, if you do graduations or you have dances or if you have yoga at your church um, and they're using music, you need to perform music license, um, vacation Bible school, etc. So this is really anything outside the kind of the worship spectrum. Because I want to remind you, the religious service exemption doesn't distinguish between religious and secular music, but you only are allowed to use it in the span of an actual worship liturgy service for a designated worship location. So that's where you have to be super care careful. It's not intended to cover performances of secular things, operas, plays, motion pictures, etc., etc. So you need special licenses to make that happen. So here is um, a question that I get every single time I talk about this. Somebody goes, but wait, 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 but what if, but what if I only want 10 seconds of a song? Or what if I only want 20 seconds of a video clip? Or it's a commercial, it's only 18 seconds. We don't need to ask permission, right? False. And then I say probably. It's only probably false. Because in most cases, the length of a recording or, or any copyrighted material doesn't alter the requirement to obtain permission. It doesn't matter if you're using one second or you're using three hours. But in some cases, it impacts the cost or the rate of the license. So here's what I would say. You should never exempt yourself from asking and receiving copyright clearance, ever. Always do more than you think you have to do. And um, I was in a workshop recently when someone said, well, the copyright law fair use doctrine, it allows for a small portion of the copyrighted work to be used without permission. Actually, that's super complicated. I took it to an attorney and that attorney said, anytime you are worried, just call an attorney from that. There is um, a book called Solve the Puzzles of Copyrights that attorney uses. There's a whole chapter, chapter three, in which the fair use is addressed by an attorney. And um, you should never assume that fair use applies to churches. It's a whole different ballgame because we already have the religious use exemption. Okay. By the way, I do want to tell you that um, court rulings have found in favor of the copyright owner for as little as 1% of copyrighted material. So you could think 29 seconds of a 40-minute copyrighted musical work could equal a million dollars. So just be super, super careful. Okay. Let's see where we're at. All right, I've talked about all the different licensing structures. I've talked about the myths. I've talked about the truths. So quickly, let me remind you, because this is where I think you probably have a lot of questions. I see um, eight different things in the chat. So making copies of printed resources. You're working on a budget. You've got to do more with less. It makes it tempting to make copies for your discipleship classes or choir practice or kids ministry. But copying a work is stealing from the author and the publisher and the distributor and anyone else who's invested time and money to get that resource to market. So don't make copies unless it says it's reproducible. Showing movie clips. The best practice of this is honestly not to take any chances. So you get CVLI or use wing clips. Purchase a site license before scheduling church movie nights. Avoid showing movie clips as a way to supplement sermons unless you've paid for it. Anytime you show a movie snippet, a television clip, a commercial, regardless of how short it is, in a, if you use a scene from The Rookie, it might be a great sermon illustration for, I don't know, signs from God, let's say, but it's going to be a rookie mistake to show the clip without getting the right permission, and you don't want to do that, especially if you're recording your sermons and you're streaming them out. Then be careful about copyrighted images. I attended a conference two months ago. Um, as an attendee, I wasn't on the panel at all, where a social media expert, I kid you not, I'm not going to say who this person is, some of you may know this, told a room full of church leaders, 
any picture they found on Google Images was safe to borrow for ministry purposes because it fell under the Religious Exemption Act. I already told you what falls under that. And then this person, I wrote it down. This is the quote. Feel free to use these images on your church websites or personal blogs and social media accounts. Unfortunately, this kind of advice really puts, position, puts uh, churches in a bad position for hefty fines and honestly public embarrassment. You, I, I know we all get it. We know how to right click on an image. That doesn't make it right though to click on the image and then copy it. Uh, you are stealing the creative work of a photographer and a graphic artist. So there are lots of websites that offer free stock photos for churches and individuals and they will be in your document as a resource list for you if you're not sure where to go. A lot of them follow what's called the Creative Commons license. So if you're unsure and you're looking at things, make sure it has a Creative Commons license because that will give you public permission to share it. Just be careful and read the fine print. We talked a little bit about projecting or printing song lyrics. I think most of us kind of know what to do on this. Um, but remember, it's okay, it's, it's okay kind of to sing copyrighted songs in service without paying for the license, but only under certain parts, that religious service exemption. So remember, you must be super careful about reproduction, copying lyrics, etc., and you must show your license for each song. Here's the deal. Somebody asked me, and I think uh, Michael sent me this question too that somebody wanted answered. So I have a license from One License or CCLI, and at the beginning of the worship service, or at the very end of the worship service, I have a slide that says, all songs in this are covered by CCLI number da 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 or onelicense.net dot da 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 and I'm covered. Abs you are absolutely not covered. You have to show your license for each song, either at the beginning, on the title slide, or at the end for each song. And each of those copyright permission granters has the way that they want that. One license is a little different than CCLI. So if you're projecting lyrics or if you're printing them in your bulletin, you have to use it in a certain format, in a certain way, and it must be attached with each song, okay? So just be careful when you're doing that. Um, recording or streaming copyrighted music, I think we all know that's a big time no-no. But with digital technology, it's really given us the ability to take kind of our message out in the world quickly and expensively. But the digital revolution has made it really easy to get in trouble. It does, the religious service exemption does not give you the right to record or distribute. You will get in trouble on your church website, on a podcast, on a live stream, any audiovisual recording, any social media platform. So be careful. You can be shut down and they do not have to grant you back your page ever again. So don't do it. And then cop posting copyrighted videos. This, these are things like on YouTube. So uh, let's say that uh, you're gearing up uh, for some series and you want to teach your leaders um, something that came out of Brene Brown's latest TED Talk um, and you're going to use that clip and so you distribute that on YouTube and then you decide, well, I'm just going to show the two minutes of that TED Talk in my, in my worship space. So you rip it off YouTube because there are applications that let you do that and then you show it. And then you say, oh, is there a problem uploading that onto YouTube later that's part of my YouTube channel? Yes, yes, there is. There's a big, 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 big no-no. Put simply, YouTube videos can be shown in your church provided that the video's on an official channel and that you have permission from the copyright owner. Here's the deal. A lot of videos on YouTube don't have permission from the original copyright. So they just put it out there. They make a lyric video and they put it out there, right? If you then also show it, both you and that person are in trouble. If you read YouTube Terms of Service, and I get it, nobody reads those but me, I'm a nerd, it specifies that the content on the site should only be accessed for personal, non-commercial use unless YouTube or the respective licensor and copyright owner of the content has given you prior and written consent. So. Um, you need to think carefully about using them. So think about it this way. There are 400 hours of video being uploaded every minute on YouTube. And, and YouTube simply cannot control or police everything that's added to the site. So it's likely that a lot of the things that you're looking at infringe copyright accidentally. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say accidentally. And I'm, I'm going to say most people do it accidentally and not deliberately. Only if the content's been uploaded by an official source and you can show that you obtained permission in written form, can be email or a letter, can you use it? That includes movie producers, music publishing houses, artists, etc. 
So it's, it's, it's the easiest way to do it. I've never had a problem doing it and most people haven't asked me to pay. So if you post those videos, you're making that copyrighted content available for free to 1 billion YouTube users. Think about it that way. And if you're not the copyright owner of the video content, you don't have the right to gift it to the world, okay? So the same applies if you're gonna post online video-driven Bible study content or music videos of Christian artists. Sharing copyrighted property will lead to YouTube flagging your account and eventually closing it just like Facebook. So with the best practice, just don't, don't do it, okay? All right, here's what I wanna leave you with before we open it for Q&A. Don't assume the church can rely on the fair use doctrine to use copyrighted materials. Just don't assume that. Rights holders decide when they wanna enforce their copyrights. So stay out of the gray, make sure you have the appropriate clearances, most of which I always find can be obtained fairly quickly and easily. Okay, now I'm gonna open it up for some questions. I'm gonna do my best to answer them. Here is my caveat. If I am not 100% certain I am answering it legally, I will tell you what I know and then say and look at the document we're sending for the actual updated legal language. How does the hymnal factor into this? So our church is doing um, YouTube services and, and I have been singing hymns or, or my songs mostly because I don't know what to do with it, but I've assumed that the hymnal is fine. Is it? It depends. That's the scary answer. Okay, so there's a great site called Hymnary. So him, then, so H-Y-M-N. Wait, did I just spell that right? A-R-Y. Okay, and you can look in there. You can type in, and it has like chalice. It has all the major uh, denominational publishers of hymnals on there, and you will see it come up. Now, here's the deal. I used a reference earlier to a song like in the 1800s. Not all songs, even though they fall in the 1800s, have let the copyright go. There might be a new adaptation. Chalice is famous for this. They add a descant. They've added um, a line of lyric. Now it's back in copyright. So you have to be super careful. Hope Publishing, for example, is covered under CCLI and One License, certain songs, certain times. Just because you're using the denominational hymnal does not mean that you've been given the right to use that and distribute it. You need to have CCLI and One License to do so. The hymnal only gives you the right to open a page and sing from it in your church worship service. But having CCLI and one license would cover that? or It should. Yeah, it absolutely should. Between those two licenses, almost every song that I see, and honestly, most things, I think there's only a handful that aren't covered under Chalice Hymnal, for example, under one license. Most of them aren't covered under CCLI. Most of them are on one license. That's why it's really important to know like what your congregation is singing from so you know what license you need. There we go. Okay. How do you figure out who to contact to get permission to use something? That's a really good question. Sometimes you can't. That's the first thing I would say. Sorry. Again, I'm all about being the Debbie Downer. So if you can't, hi, if you can't, if you can't find it, like Google, Google's your friend here. Okay. If you can't find it, then just let it go. But, but what I would say, like, if you're looking for a song, usually if you Google the song and say publisher, like, um, I don't know what song, uh, 10,000 reasons publisher, it'll pop up and usually it will have contact info for that. Okay. And on the website for most publishers now, it will say for rights management, they have a, they have a whole link that you can go to and it gives you an email address and how long to expect to have that back. So that's what I would recommend that you do. Okay, so this would be a question that would not include streaming or recording, okay. but it would be over Zoom. If we buy a Bible study course and Zoom it over and, and study it over Zoom as a Sunday school class, mm -hmm. but it never leaves the group, mm -hmm. how is that covered? So you're not recording it. You're, you're not no. using a Zoom record. You're fine. It's like doing it live. You're fine as long as each person has the content. Um, the instructor yes. writes his own lesson. You're perfect then. It's, it's original content. But there's always a video that goes with it. Okay. Um, that's part of the prepared study materials by the author. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so there's a book, a video, a DVD, and a study guide. The, the instructor has all of that purchased right. mm -hmm. and shows the video and then his own prepared lesson content. Right. So in the material you bought, there should be a page that has copyright info. And in that, on that page, it will say whether or not you can show that outside of your church. Again, you should always assume that when you buy something like that, it is only for use inside your church building. So what I would, if, if, you, if it's not in there, what I would recommend that you do is contact the publisher and say, we're doing Sunday school via Zoom because we're not meeting in our church building. We're not recording it. Are you okay with us showing the video? I've had okay. this happen several times. Not one person has told me no. Okay. And all of them are like, thank you for calling and asking. So I always say ask. People don't say no. It's rare. I've had one time someone has said no, and it was to use a song. So, but um, just it should be in there on how you can use that. Because a lot of people have home study groups, and it specifically says in there, available for home study to show in someone's living room. The language is different depending study to study and publisher to publisher. So just look and see. But don't record it. Whatever you do, don't record it and distribute it. Okay. Tag team on that question. So how, what do you recommend for managing the responses that come back? Like what's the smartest way? Do you have the church secretary handle those? Do you handle them as the pastor? Does the music director do them? What's the smartest way for a church to manage those asks? And like, so they can prove it and be like, boom, see, we did get permission. Right. I, all of the things that we do run through our office. And that's because if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, we still have it on file in the church office. So I would recommend that you don't, I would definitely recommend you don't make your pastor handle that because pastors are notoriously terrible at details. But instead, what I would say is have your admin, an admin person, just kind of manage that. And to be helpful to them, you could just do a formatted email. Yes. Um, I just had a question. Have, have you ever encountered a time where uh, the artist and perhaps their publisher had a difference of opinion about use? For example, if I had asked, emailed a, a children's book author to be able to read their book at Christmas Eve for our service and everything else, and they said yes, would the publisher be able to come back and say, we didn't give you permission? Yes. Okay. That's. It gets stinky winky, doesn't it? So. Yeah. But, but here's what I would say is, is, is that going to happen? Probably not. If you are a super large church and your YouTube channel you're doing this on has, you know, 1 million subscribers, it is possible because you can monetize your channel at a certain point when you have so many subscribers. And that's really when you start getting noticed more. But again, mm -hmm. the, even if you just have the children's author, that's going to cover you because you can say, I went to the original source of that. I went to the original source. So, but just be careful because if you're showing the pictures from the published book, the publisher holds that, not necessarily the author, unless it's self-published. Congregations that are putting at the top of their Facebook Live, you know, underneath the video of their broadcast on Sunday morning, we don't own the rights to any of this music, and then showing the slides and singing in any way, they're more liable than had they not written anything there at all, right? Yeah, it's the same. Okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they wrote that or not. They're still not in compliance. Yep. And and what I would say to help everyone uh, is, let's say you're putting it on Facebook and or YouTube and in the comments on that, like when you populate your YouTube, there's a whole comment feature before the actual comments, right? So that populates the description in the, in the description of things. I always link to any artist's website. The music came from these people and here's how to find out more. If I uh, talked about, if I used a poem, even if I had permission, I write it in there, just like if I was printing out my sermon copy and I have all the references, think of it as a reference page. That descriptor box is really important. And that will also help keep you in compliance if you've done your due diligence. I have a question about CCLI song select. Yes. I, I know there's some public domain songs there that they there provide are. you the scripts, the chords, the lyrics, everything. And I assume that's okay to broadcast or do you need the broadcast license piece of the CCLI? Yes, that? always. Anything that's Yo. covered under, okay. if, if it's searchable on Song Select, 
you um, always put your licensing on there. Yes. And yes. if you go to the CCLI website, which I've been giving you that in the resources, they have a whole thing that says, here's how it has to look. Okay. So just follow their template so that you stay in compliance. Okay. And then there's two other levels of song select mm -hmm. where you pay for right. two different levels. And I'm not sure what that gives you. In uh, the chart, I hate to put you off again, but in the chart that I'm giving you, I'm okay. showing you all the different options. A lot of that gets to where we've got churches who have multiple sites. So now they've got to have different things uh, for different sites. They're using different kinds of music at several different sites. That They, they, they might have a youth service and um, a, in one building and a worship service and then traditional mm -hmm. service. And also it gives you access to different types of publishers. So I'll, I'll make sure that that's really clear in the document I'm giving you. But I would say it is so easy to call Christian Copyright Solutions yes. and CCLI and One License, get on the phone with them and say, here's my situation, here's my church size, here's what we're doing. And they are so nice. Yes. And they will say, great, here's what you need. They're so yes. good. So don't necessarily even listen to me. Like if you want a quicker answer, you might be better off just to call them tomorrow. Yep. I did call them uh, on some stuff. Uh, and one of the things I want to read, read from the uh, CCLI licensing thing says, uh, let's see, says these credits, you know, credits for the songs would be posted in the stream itself and could be after each song or at the end of their song service, in quotes, song mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. So so it's not necessarily at the end of the broadcast, which you right. wouldn't want. But, right. That's correct. That's correct. So again... Um, you, you need to just have it at every song. They, they say that because there are some churches that will do um, like Amazing Grace and then go into a chorus of another song and come back to Amazing Grace. And it would be awkward visually to have it at the okay. beginning of each of those. So at the end of that piece that you've smushed some together, okay, so think of smushing a bit, several songs together in a medley, you can have it at the end of that. But okay. you just need to, other, and most churches don't necessarily do that, but you just need to think of every song as the ability to get dinged. So at every song, you need to have your rights managed. When we are getting our CCL license annually, it's based upon our uh, worship attendance. Mm -hmm. And since we are now uh, on live streaming, I've gone from worship attendance of, let's say, average of 100 to an average of 350. Yes. Does the views count as where I've got to get my license level to? Um, yes. No? Yes. Yes. Okay. It so does. I did a worship service uh, for a funeral last week where um, it was 1,200 views for the funeral service. I don't think that they would ever ding you because of a funeral or a wedding because okay. that's a one-time okay. um, event. Okay. I, I, I do ask if there's a lot of music that's secular in nature at a wedding or a funeral, I ask for them to buy a one-time license, the family, to buy a one-time license that covers the church, if, especially if it's going to be streamed or recorded, which most of those are. But, but for your worship, I would just start keeping, that's why it's important to keep average attendance because when th this is going to come around a lot when, when licenses start to renew based on your date is um, they can easily Google your church and see if you've got a Facebook page, how many people have been engaging with your video. So you just want to be, I, I always say be ethical and just report. Well, and that's what my concern was because as we're doing it with this new live streaming, it's, it's changed all of those dynamics. Right. And, um, well, for instance, that 1,200 views, they muted yes. the music. Yep. They, they allowed the worship service to go ahead and stay, but they muted the music within the, the service. Uh, Facebook did that. Yep. They do that all the time. Okay. And and they do it even when you've got when you even have copyrights because the algorithm can't pick up the fact you've had the copyrights so far, but you want to have it anyway, because if it, if that happens so many times, Facebook will just shut down your page. Okay. So you need to have proof that you've been doing the right thing. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're Tom. welcome. So my question is, we're not displaying the words on the live stream. I've got a pianist who plays music. I've got a song leader who sings. Mm -hmm. I need to display my licenses for each of those events individually, even though I'm not displaying the words or 
Okay, How, so what's the best practice? Well, in so what I would say is you're performing those those tunes. Yep. Okay. You're and um, that's a separate license. That's the perform license, not necessarily the CCLI license. So you just need to be super careful. What I would say is, would, would you get in trouble? I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine because you have a license. You're trying to do the right thing. What I would, if you had hired me as a consultant, what I would say is, okay, so you don't have the lyrics projected. That's what CCLI covers, remember, the printing or reproduction of lyrics in paper or on a screen. You're not doing that. So it's just like having special music, right? So I would still encourage you to at least have your license listed somewhere. Okay, so my the way I've started doing that, and, and again, this is all new, is I've, is I've used that comment section you talked about where uh -huh. we upload our, and I list my licenses there. Great. Um, as long as you're not printing any lyrics in the comments, as yep, long as nope. they don't see them projected anywhere, as long as you haven't sent the lyrics ahead in an email, or a, like a lot of churches have a digital bulletin they're sending on a Friday, for the Sunday service that people could call up on their email while they're watching, that's considered printing of lyrics. So as long as you're okay, not doing my CCLI things, right? license covers that, right? It does, as long as you've got it stated on each song that that's what that is. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> it's got to so, go in our bulletins now, okay. And that, so, so Suzanne, if you had a streaming license, that doesn't cover the performance of songs sung out of the hymnal. Cur you would have to have the the streaming podcast license from one license. Okay. It's really it's let me tell you as the pastor of a small church, we had to really wrestle. I had to go beg and borrow for money to be able to be in compliance because we did not have the money in our worship budget to do this. It was so cost prohibitive. So it but it but I I reminded them if we got dinged one time, it's way more than what I'm asking you to spend. Uh, Office of General Minister and President also wants to help inform and equip churches. Um, everybody's kind of in a different place. Some people are streaming from phones, some with, you know, high-end multi-camera setups, and, and many are somewhere in between. And there's a, a lot of hunger out there for for fixing the problems and being in compliance and getting, a, you know, better audio and video. And so OGMP is is working on some training materials for that. Uh, both some that are free, just resources that are going to be out there for anybody to to go and watch or read or consume. Um, and maybe we're even talking about a full day, like full on training session with, you know, multiple presenters that would cost something. Um, but anyway, um, we'll push that as soon as we get dates and, and know more, have something to share. We'll send it out to everybody, too. Uh, again, thank you all very much. If you don't know, Andrew Moran is one of our disciple uh, uh, talented disciple musicians and creators and go ahead Andrew tell everybody where they can find your work well you're going to need a few licenses to you no just kidding <laughs> I, I chatted Michael in the sidebar and said Lord this is the reason I write music so I don't have to ask anyone else's permission <laughs> you can find mine at andrewmoran.com or in Chalice Press I don't I need to do some more research on what license you would need to use it from Chalice Press, but I'm learning, I'm learning along with you. So thanks for letting me crash, crash the Oklahoma party. <laughs>